The gunmen opened fire in this parking lot on the east side of the church, shooting five people. One died at the scene. So did the gunman, who was shot by a church security guard. When you see the blood and you hear the shots, nobody has enough training when they go into that. I'm Carl Chen. I'm the president of the Faith-Based Security Network. Time. Yeah. Good shot. The main thing is that you're you're focusing on the front sight and that you're standing the same way each time, that you're holding that weapon, that you've got good sight picture and sight alignment. There is a science to shooting. In 91, 92, I was working for Focus on the Family, and uh, we had a bomb threat. Just didn't take it very serious in those days. Everything was a false alarm. Focus wasn't real popular with everybody in town at the time. Two months later, it happened again. And that started getting our attention. We designed this system that would come across to our radios. We had just put it in and had not yet even tested it on the National Day of Prayer on May 2nd, 1996, when my radio went off and said administration building front desk. I was looking at my watch as I walked up to the front desk. I remember thinking 17 seconds, not bad. I could be here pretty quick if there was a real deal. And I looked up and I was face to face with a gun and a very angry gunman. Had a pile of green army bags on the floor in which he claimed was enough explosives to bring the building down. He had a trigger device connected to those bags in his left hand. He had a firearm in his right hand. Uh, started claiming the trigger device was a dead man trigger and if anybody did anything to him, he'd drop it and the explosives would go off. We got a really good police negotiator on the phone and he negotiated for our release and we were released and then Four and a half hours later, they talked him out of there and he gave up and surrendered. Among other things, I was able to get our home church, New Life Church in Colorado Springs. I was one of four who put together their security plan up there. We call it the Life Safety Ministry. And because we had a ministry, we had an intentional team that was already put together. We were ready when a killer came on December 9th, 2007, killed two girls in the parking lot, made it about 60 feet inside the doors before one of our armed people shot him. And when he saw that the gig was up, he killed himself. And since that time, <clears throat> I've gotten intrigued more and more by this whole subject of security and faith-based organizations. I began researching it. I was seeing a trend that I had not previously identified and this trend was something that I called deadly force incidents. Whether a firearm's involved or not, I want to know when there was real blood threatened or shed. Those are hard to sweep under the rug. <laughs> Media is going to get a hold of it. There's going to be police reports. So that became a category that I could quantify. Well, as of the end of 2017, I tracked over 1,700 deadly force incidents at faith-based organizations in the United States. Of those, 479 of them were murder events where there was at least one victim. Since many of those murder events had more than one victim, there's 618 victims. Then you add in suicide and other violent deaths. We've had over eight hundred violent deaths in faith-based organizations since January 1st of 1999. Homicides, suicides, and a third category that caught me by surprise that I had no inkling of was the number of people who choose a church parking lot or a church as their last stand with law enforcement. It's a very common thing. This is what the Orozco family found at Immaculate Heart of Mary Church when they arrived for 5 o'clock Mass. This is a parking lot of a church called Iglesia Cristiana. And uh, as we know right now, it was an overnight shooting. Breaking news tonight, a shooting in a church parking lot. One woman is dead and her daughter is badly wounded. So what I do a lot of my day, so I have all these categories I go through here. 
and uh, fill in each of these categories and it ends with uh, uh, we have data here on the aggressor. Was it an unknown aggressor? Did they commit suicide? Were they killed in the action? Were they arrested? Was it a male, female, lone? Or did they act with others? Were they affiliated? And then we go on over here and we look at the triggers. Was it a domestic? Was it a personal conflict, a robbery, gang, drugs related, uh, religious bias? And that's any kind of bias. Uh, or was it random? Did it happen inside or outside? And I fill in all of these things, including uh, what type of ministry it happened at, what, what the category was, uh, Methodist, Presbyterian, Jewish, Scientology, whatever it was. Uh, I have my limits. I mean, Scientology is about the edge of my limits. Those people are off the rocker. I track blood or the possibility of blood. I want to know where is the real danger. And when we get to these statistics, this tells a story. Those three, robbery, domestic abuse, and personal conflict between two or more people are the three most deadly things that can happen at a church. I travel, I speak at events anywhere from 40 to 60 times a year. One of the things I tell all of my audiences is this isn't about guns or not guns. It's about having intentional security or not having intentional security. That said, I am a believer that the number one best tool to stop a bad guy with a gun is a properly trained, intentional guy with a gun or gal. I, I believe it's the best tool to stop an active killer. If you're asking a pastor of a 100-member church in downtown Detroit if he's got security, he's probably going to say, yep, sure do, you know, because uh, I know brother so-and-so carries a gun. That is not security. They need to have training. You heard Pete mention front sight, focusing on the front sight. What you want to do is you want to come up and get on that front sight as soon as you can. You want to go back. You want to check both sides and uh, reholster as soon as you possibly can. Uh, we're going to have a disgruntled father um, who's a non custodial parent. Uh, come in to the children's area. We need somebody to... My name is Jeff Henry, and I've been the Life Safety Ministry Director uh, here since um, I believe it was 2009. Our training is based on scenarios, and the scenarios are based on real-world uh, situations that have actually happened. And they range from everywhere from somebody just being agitated or angry um, and may need a word of comfort or somebody to pray with them, all the way up to somebody purposefully doing a, a, a committing an evil act of murder. And we train all up and down that continuum of force. You want to be in that interview stance. It's like, sir, you know, I know you're really agitated right, right now. We'd love to help you and see what we can do, but I need you to calm down. Can you come on over here with me and let's talk about what, what Yeah, that's good. Because my hands are here. My hands are here. If he was to do anything, I'm right here. I can respond. When I was a kid, I grew up in rural Iowa. Uh, nobody had any security. The church was a safe place. That was kind of the mentality, and that was true for many years. Um, 2007, with the New Life, attack really changed the trajectory of thinking about that um, and that was when many church security teams were initially formed. I saw a need and I felt led by God to join and to train. We have a scriptural basis for what we do, like Nehemiah for example, uh, who was very clear that he needed to have um, his people protected and be armed. If somebody is hurting and broken, we want them here. That's, they're in the right place. They, they, they need God, and that's what we're here to help them. We just want to make sure they don't hurt or break anybody else. Hey, I said I want to see my son. Drive it down. Drive that right down. Well, dominant hand only and two hands, uh, that's pretty easy, and that gives you a false sense of security. We're going to ch change it up today. We're going to be shooting uh, strong hand only. Uh, support hand only, uh, different positions, improvised positions, etc.
Jeff, you good? I'm good. You all right, Bill? You good? Look out! Look out! My background is I'm actually a chiropractic physician, I'm a chiropractor, um, but my training is that I've been an NRA uh, handgun and rifle instructor for many years. This is not shooting practice, we all know how to shoot. Um, that's pretty simple. Um, this is practicing to fight with a handgun. Uh, that's a different mentality, that's a different thing, that's a different animal. Um, it should be assumed that shooting and sending that round where you want it to go is second nature. That firearm should feel like a part of your body. Uh, when you tied your shoes, I bet you didn't have to think about a little bunny ear here, a little bunny ear here, go around the tree. No, it just happened. And that's what we train to do here. It just has to happen. Okay, so this next one will be a draw and transition to your support hand, two rounds to the thoracic cavity. And the go command. Range is clear, line is set. Ready, go. <laughs> so let's uh, let's close with a, a word of prayer, and um, then we'll get things packed up, and we'll go relax and be warm. How's that? <laughs> I would assume the father wouldn't know what room the child's in, but we don't know that the father doesn't drop the child off at some times in the past. We call it the Life Safety Ministry um, because it is a ministry. Uh, sometimes people just come in and uh, they're looking to connect with somebody, or they have a need, and uh, but maybe their body language is there's just something that doesn't quite look right. And so we'll approach them and just be, we call it being aggressively friendly. Um, so we'll approach them and say, uh, hi, I haven't seen you before. I'm Tim. Can I, can I help you with anything? Help you find anybody? And if they're there for legitimate reasons, they've been welcomed. Um, and so that's a win. And if they're there for nefarious reasons, they've been noticed and they know it. And that's also a win. Cool. I like that one. All right, like so let's do that with visual. some waste pods now. Get your thing. Yep, and then look for the next one. Oh. There you go. Yeah, you can reload on the move. Yep. Point your thumbs at me. Now, so at my old agency, it was one way, and the new one, actually, so this is how I prefer it, because mm -hmm. it's real simple. Point your thumbs yeah. at me, and I come in, I don't grab my cuffs yet, but I'm about yeah. to, just in case he breaks, and I get it, and I lock him up. Okay. That way, if you try to swing at me with this hand... Yep, you just break his wrist. Yeah, just, I got, I got good control of him. Yeah. But this agency, here, is like, eh, we don't like breaking wrists. So, they, <laughs> so theirs is, interlock your fingers. If you take him down in the sanctuary, he can still yell whatever things he's trying to do to disrupt the service. Mm -hmm. It is possibly creating a panic to a lot of people in the service. Like, at what, at, at what stage do we finally consider it is, it is more important to just subdue him than to get him out of the sanctuary first? You only want to subdue him if he's physically doing something. If he's running his mouth, he's running his mouth. He right. hasn't legally attacked anybody or even threatened anybody. I mean, maybe okay. if he's saying something threatening, but if he's just spouting off of the mouth. So really, it's, dude, come on, come on, come with me. You can't really do too much force. Otherwise, you're going to have a lawsuit on your hands. Okay. At that point, he needs to be legally trespassed, and that's yeah. where we, we got to have PD yeah. come in and... Yeah, I think it's going to go. Intentional readiness. Those two words have defined my last 20 years. Intentional readiness. That, that doesn't mean that I want firearms in 100% of the churches. I, my, my goals are all based around intentional readiness. And that means different things for different people. I do believe in firearms. I believe they're the best tool to, to stop a threat. But I'm not ready to say that I have a goal of seeing X percent of churches armed. That isn't really where I'm starting with my goal. My goal is to see 100 percent of churches be intentional about the safety of their people. Unfortunately, what I experience more than anything is a politicized split that just drives me nuts.
if you're on one side of the political aisle, you don't believe in firearms in your church, and if you're on the other side, you do. To me, that is the most bizarre thing that I've witnessed, and I think that's a far more definable line than male or female, east or west, uh, uh, denomination by denomination. I mean, you look at the Unitarians. They do not want firearms in their, in their churches. All the shots have to be inside the bottle, so he's very easily inside the bottle. Part of the reason that we started the FBSN is based on the model that we'd done here in Colorado Springs. Uh, we wanted to take that model nationwide. And I'll tell you when it should have started. It should have started on September the 15th, 1963. That's when the four little girls were killed in Birmingham, Alabama. The first mass murder, 176 years of American liberty, and we'd never had a mass murder at a faith-based organization in the United States until Birmingham. For hours this morning, residents in the area were told to shelter in place as SWAT teams raced through the streets. When the Tree of Life synagogue happened in October of 2018, that was the 15th mass murder that we've had a faith-based organization in the United States with four or more killed in any one incident. I've been in Birmingham so many times and walked through the 16th Street Baptist Church. I've stood where those four girls were killed. <clears throat> it's not just a number of four. It's people that we as a society have let die. And that's what I want to correct. I just... I. It, if the education can help people, I want to do that. I want to get the, the message out there that we can, we're better together. I mean, that's why we did the FBSN. We're trying to get better together. If you're not training, you're saying it'll never happen here. You're still not convinced that it's going to happen here.